Um, I'm going to give you a, um, an overview of uh, binaural audio. I'm going to focus, uh, actually, I'm very glad the scheduling is the way it was. Um, you just, just had a wonderful intro to binaural audio. And yesterday, I hear you, you heard a lot about uh, all kinds of things, wave field synthesis, eigen mics, and uh, maybe you heard a bit about um, ambisonics. Did you get some information about ambisonics? Okay, great. So hopefully, I won't have to define too many terms from scratch. I'm going to concentrate on binaural, and I'm going to try to convince you that actually binaural, uh, today, we can do it very well with speakers. We can deliver binaural audio with speakers. Um, we can also do it with headphones. You've already heard some of the challenges of what it takes to do it over headphones, and I will say a little bit more about that. So I'm going to review binaural uh, in general with a focus on what sometimes people call transaural, uh, which is binaural through two loudspeakers. Um, and I'll try to convince you that it's a very natural way, and it can be a very effective way if we do it correctly, to get 3D audio to uh, not only one person, as, as you'll see, is relatively, relatively easy to get to one person, but also to more than one, one person uh, to listen from two loudspeakers or, or a collection of loudspeakers delivering binaural audio um, in very accurate 3D uh, for, uh, for a listener. This is a quite different approach than what we call the sound field approaches, where we are re reconstructing a sound field. Uh, binaural, as you already know, you only worry about re reconstructing the information about the sound field at the uh, two ears of the listener. You forget about re reconstructing the sound field in space. This will all become clearer, I hope, in a few minutes. I'm going to say a few words about uh, these techniques, which is uh, the first one is wave field, wave field synthesis. Uh, of course, the other technique to get 3D audio is the amb ambisonics, or how today we talk about higher order ambisonics. And the third one is binaural. And when binaural is applied to loudspeakers, uh, we, you will see very soon that we need something called crosstalk cancellation. That's what that XTC is. So binaural over headphones, you don't need crosstalk cancellation, but with speakers, you need crosstalk cancellation. Binaural over headphones has its own problems and challenges, and binaural over loudspeakers have, has its own cha challenges and problems, which were thought to be very difficult and very problematic until a few years ago. These problems are now pretty much have been solved, most of them, if not all of them. So uh, both binaural over headphones and loudspeakers are very, uh, very um, uh, viable ways to get 3D audio. In many ways, as you'll see, the binaural over loudspeakers, there are now very powerful tools to get them uh, correctly, probably with even less, prob uh, less effort than binaural over, over headphones. Now, all these techniques, the first two techniques uh, rely on um, recreating the sound field, reconstructing the sound field, rather, um, as accurately as possible using many transducers. Many transducers to record, uh, mi many microphones, so to speak, if you're recording an acoustic field, and many um, speakers to play back. I, I presume this is the wave field synthesis system. That's what it is. OK, so it's a good example. I usually carry a picture of something like this, but here it is, <laughs> first time live. <laughs> um, so um, the idea there, again, you've heard a lot about it. This is a caricature for. Uh, people who are uh, way behind you in, in education, so to speak. But um, the idea is com almost uh, very <coughs> rudimentary. You have a point source. You record with many microphones capturing uh, a spatial sample of the sound field. And then you have many speakers reconstructing a, a spatial, that spatial sound field again. Um, the, of course, this is a caricature in that box called wave synthesis. There are all kinds of coding. There's decoding. To reconstruct the sound correctly, there are all kinds of problems. Uh, have, you have spatial aliasing. You have all kinds of reconstruction problems. But um, the idea is to get a bird to appear, uh, you know, in space, for example, at a, uh, or at, at some location as real as possible. Uh, that's the goal of 3D audio, as opposed to having um, a image in a loudspeaker. Uh, you're giving the human cues to locate sound in 3D space where, where it accur accurately was. Again, as I said, I usually have this picture, but again, all you have to do is just look at the other side of the room to see wave field synthesis. It's not a trivial system. The second method is ambisonics. One could show formally, mathematically, that both ambisonics and wave field synthesis uh, are based on the same physical and mathem uh, mathematical principle, which is the uh, Helmholtz-Kirchhoff theorem, which we teach for students taking uh, wave uh, theory in, in physics. But basically, this theorem says that if you sample, if you record 
a field, a wave field, it doesn't have to be sound field, it could be light field, it could be waves on the surface of, of water, any wave field, uh, it could be RF waves, but in our, for our interest, acoustic waves, if you record acoustic waves on any closed contour, in principle you have all the information to reconstruct, I'm simplifying the theorem, to reconstruct that, uh, that sound field anywhere inside that contour, uh, or outside that contour depending on the conditions, but generally you, you have the capability if you, if you record over a closed contour, which is any line that goes on itself, if you sample the sound field on many points, which in our case would be many microphones, uh, you have information that the, the theorem will allow you to, so to speak, decode it into a reconstruction of the sound field. From an acoustic point of view, that decoding happens, of course, through uh, loudspeakers, and we have, uh, in principle, an infinite number of loudspeakers, infinite number of, uh, uh, of microphones, we can have almost a holographic reconstruction, if, if there are no errors, of that sound field. Of course, we are very far from there because of all kinds of problems. Um, now, that field has evolved a lot. I know here th there is a system that people work on it. Um, the third approach is, uh, does not aim to reconstruct a sound field. It aims at gives, give, giving you the, um, give, give the listener, just at the interest of, its, of the listener's ear canals, the information the listener needs to perceive sound in three, three field, in 3D. So it's a far lesser goal. Uh, I mean, far um, smaller, smaller mountain to climb. You're not trying to reconstruct the sound field in an actual space. You're just trying to fool the listener into perceiving the cues that you, uh, you want uh, him or her to, to get to put sound in 3D space. So th this is, in other words, um, one could argue that this is simpler and possibly more elegant just because it requires less transducers. And natural, why is it natural? Because this is how we hear. We don't have more than two transducers. So in principle, we should, stereo is the ideal uh, 3D delivery mechanism, I mean, uh, format, because it has supposedly all the information we need to hear in 3D. Our challenge is to make sure we get that information recorded correctly on, this, on two channels and delivered to our two transducers. We only have two transducers. So in principle, from a purely you know, axiomatic point of view, we, one should say, one should expect that uh, two channels for two transducers has all the information a human needs to locate sound perfectly in 3D. When I say perfectly, it means we really have to get many things right, including equalization of transducers, uh, make sure that the, uh, the cues that we need to uh, hear are transmitted correctly, recorded correctly, transmitted correctly, individualized, as we heard from the previous talk, Individualization of H, uh, HRTF dependence but, um, between people is so important that uh, anything uh, out of uh, whack in terms of matching of HRTFs can, can degrade the uh, spatial fidelity of the imaging. All right, so uh, I'm going to concentrate then on uh, this binaural technique uh, we, you heard about some time uh, for some you know, previous lecture. Uh, but I'm going to also, um, as I said, uh, concentrate on the focus on the speaker's part. But before I do so, I would like to review with you, which I'm sure you've heard about quite a, quite a lot in this conference, the three types of cues that humans uh, use to locate sound in 3D. You already learn a lot about ILD, ITD, and probably spe special cues, but just to review them very quickly. Um, we know that if I, name, what's the name of the gentleman here? Ishmael. Ishmael. So if I, if I make a click right here on the left side of Ishmael's head, uh, he can tell that I am on the left and not the right because the, the, that sound wave, or those sound waves, this packet of sound waves from the click, arrive a little bit later on his right ear than the left ear. And his brain can tell the difference then to, then down to about 10 microseconds. Uh, that, that's the ITD. And we, our brain ear system is very uh, acute, very powerful at resolving these uh, ITD because of our, you know, we survived. Uh, we are, um, we survived uh, because we learned how to locate that proverbial bear in the forest or tiger in the forest as we heard earlier. Um, and those who did not survive don't have any, uh, you know, progenies. So we are pretty much the, the sons and daughters of people who learned that lesson correctly and we can locate sound very accurately in, in, in uh, based on ITD. Um, ILD, well, this is, a, this is again a caricature of the ITD. Uh, somebody sitting on the right hand side of the stage uh, will sing or make a, um, or say something. 
there's a difference in time in arrival of time one, time two at the years, and that uh, gives you the ITD cube. Now, ILD also you've heard about, and you already know it's the same thing except now with level. So because I'm on the left side, the head shadowing, especially higher frequencies, uh, will cause the sound to be softer on Ishmael's uh, left ear than the right ear, uh, rather right ear than left ear. Um, now, of course, that you can already, already guess that the ILD and the ITD are frequency dependent. The shadowing of the head depends on the wavelength. And uh, Ishmael's head, like all our heads, is on the order of a few, uh, about 10, 10, 15 centimeters, uh, characteristic, uh, 15, 20 centimeters characteristic dimension. So frequencies above 2, 3 kilohertz will be blocked more than frequency lower than 2, 3 kilohertz because they will wrap around and so on. So, but generally, on the average, ILD is on the order of Anywhere between uh, 2 dB and above uh, can be resolved very accurately by humans. Now, what happens if I stay right in the center in front of Ishmael and make a click? He won't be able to tell it, uh, the location based on ILD and ITD. Why? Because what's the ILD here? Zero. The difference, the, uh, D stands for difference. So the difference between left and right ear is zero. What's the ITD? Also zero. That uh, the uh, if I do it you know accurately, that the waves arrive at the same time in left and right ear. Therefore, according to these cues, these cues are, go are, gonna, are not going to help him at all locate sound. Yet he can locate sound. If I ask him to close his eyes and I go up and down, he, he can tell. And if I go behind him, he can also tell. Uh, there's a bit of front way, uh, back confusion uh, has to do with our visual uh, system, as mentioned before. But nonetheless. He can still locate sound in 3D despite the fact that he's getting no ILD, no ITD cues. That means there must be something else. And that something else is what we heard about quite a bit in the previous lecture, the HRTF, the, uh, the, the, the spectral part of the HRTF. So spectral cues are what give you this extra uh, information, which has to do with the coloration that your pinna, especially your pinna, but your entire head and also your torso impacts as the sound travels from a source to your ear canal and gets colored in a certain way, uh, in this individual way, as we also heard, unless if you have a, a, um, a perfect twin, uh, you're, it's like a fingerprint, as we heard, this, this will be a coloring the sound source differently for every person. And these spectral cues are what our brain ear system expects to hear uh, for sound of a given location. So. Um, even when there's no ILD or ITD, the spectral cues, our own spectral cues, help us very, um, are very helpful in, in locating sound correctly. So here we can, we can change the pinna of dummy heads, study their, uh, the spectral cues. Here, for example, is a certain pinna and showing how the azimuth at the elevation of the or location of the source impacts the uh, uh, Frequency response, you can see all these notches at uh, but, you know, about 3 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz, and around 8 kilohertz especially, where the, a lot of human pinnas have caused these uh, irregular uh, non-flat frequency response, which our brain uses to locate sound on top of ILD, ITD. So it seems that if we want to do binaural audio, um, all we need to do to zero. Th now, I'm skipping other cues, of course. There are other lesser order cues to locate sound. We already meant, uh, talked about, uh, heard about, uh, for example, the ratio of direct to reflected sound is important to locate depth. Okay? Um, if I, I, can, I can walk in such a way that ILD, ITD are the same, and once you get far enough from a human, as we heard today, the HRTF becomes, then the far field HRTF becomes more or less constant. Yet your brain can locate depth despite the, the fact that these cues are not working anymore. And that is because your brain interprets the, uh, the echo and the reverb, the early reflections and the late reflections, and their relation to direct sound as information about depth. So there are other, other uh, uh, lesser cues, so to speak, to locate, to locate sound. But the three main things, ILD, ITD, spectral cues. So to capture these and deliver them, all we have to do is put microphones in your ears, or if you don't have your head, uh, we'll put them in, in a dummy head and then record a, record a sound field. We can do that also after convolution by do, using, taking the HRTF measurement and uh, do, doing that on the computer. But just to, to, to be, uh, to be uh, visual and tactical about it, let's talk about a real head. We put microphones in their ears. We ask someone to walk around. And uh, we are capturing on stereo what we call the binaural 
signal, uh, which is the IL, the ITD, spectral cues, everything we need to deliver eventually to the listener, ideally the same listener if you want to have uh, no mismatching in the HRTF. Okay, this is fine um, as long as uh, you have a way to, well, I'm sorry, the goal is to get it to appear uncorrupted at the left and right ear of the listener. So if you're using headphones, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on today, uh, although I'll tell you about a, a new technology that allows you to get binaural audio uh, to, through headphones for a much larger percentage of people than, than binaural audio by itself, uh, which in other words, a processing stage, which I'll describe later on, um, which is based on the transoral technique. So uh, this is why I'm going to focus on the transoral technique first. But to get audio through cloud speakers, uh, through, um, through headphones, which is the most natural way to get the right and left um, uh, record, uh, channels to your ears. There are a number of challenges, some of which we've he heard about. Let's go over the challenges. First, we want to make sure that the HRTF are matched. We learned that if you don't have, um, we have a mismatch in the HRTF, meaning if I record with Ishmael's head and I listen to it myself, I'm going to have all kinds of problems that was listed in the previous uh, view graphs, um, previous talk. Um, much worse front back localization, head, head externalization, Basically, any time your brain hears or gets wrong cues, cues that, that doesn't expect, doesn't correspond to reality, especially if they conflict with visual, with the visual uh, input, your brain is trying to protect you from the proverbial bear and will put that, will locate the actual transducer. Because okay? that's what's causing the sound. Okay? And the transducer is, when you're wearing headphones, is always here. So you're always fighting head interiorization of sound. If any mismatch, is, uh, if anything goes wrong, bang, the sound gets closer to your head, because that's what the transducers are. But if you use the transducers to get the cues to your head where the sound uh, is in 3D space, and nothing corrupts those cues, then you can fool your brain to thinking the sound is not coming from the transducer. But any time you stop fooling the brain, the brain is going to protect you for your own sake and find the transducers which are so close to you. This is why a uh, uh, headphone sound is always very close to you. So if you play anything non-binaural on headphones, doesn't matter what, how much you spend on your headphones, um, you, it's always going to be very, very close to you. Uh, or, or actually, if you, plan it, uh, if you don't do any crossfeed, it's going to be inside your head, um, very close or ve uh, inside your head. So what do we have to do to get sound outside the head? We learn first is we have to get the, uh, make sure the HRTF match. But what happens if I record with Ishmael's head? Unless, if Ishmael, do you have a twin? No. That's it, so he cannot sell it to anyone. So, <laughs> so that recording is only for him, so to speak, for uh, um, exactitude. And uh, now, I'm gonna, if I have some time, I'm going to show you at the end of my talk ways where we can uh, record generically using what's called an eigenmark, which you heard about yesterday. And that codes the sound field in, um, in um, spherical harmonics, and then we can measure the HRTF or scan it or use any of the techniques that people are working on to produce the HRTF very quickly. In my lab, in our anechoic chamber now, we can get an HRTF. Uh, if you walk in, you come out about 10 minutes later with a USB stick with your sofa formatted HRTF. But still, that requires an anechoic chamber and a lot of equipment. Uh, and we are working on techniques using um, uh, not scans, but uh, vector, uh, vector uh, uh, um, Vector scans, basically, these are much cheaper to, to get a reconstruction of your head using spherical harmonics matching between database and, and, and uh, uh, database of scans and database of HRTF. But I'm not going to talk about that today. But it, what I'm trying to tell you is that a lot of people are working on getting HRTF obtained quickly. So if you, there are ways, a posteriori, in other words, after in post-production or in real time, you use a microphone like this, and you can specialize that recording to everybody in this room. So that problem can be solved, okay? It requires that we have the HRTF of everyone, and we have a higher order ambisonics recording. Then we can solve the problem of mismatches. But there are a lot of other problems. One of them mentioned earlier also is the headphones equalization. Uh, you need to tell your brain, fool your brain that you're not wearing headphones. That takes a lot. <laughs> First, the mere pressure of the headphones on your head tells your brain there's something there. But more importantly, the acoustic pressure. There's an impedance between the, the transducer and the interest of the ear canal. You need to equalize for that. You need to uh, take it out or produce an inverse filter that takes it out. And the problem, and this is why uh, 
the speaker before me told you it's another half year of uh, papers here, uh, because every time, it's a, very, it's a very challenging problem, every time you take the headphones, you put them back on, unless it's a perfectly proposition at very high frequency, these notches um, in the equalization will become peaks, for example, and then everything is off. So deriving equalizations for headphones, for binaural audio, to make your brain forget about the headphones is not trivial, okay? So there's that, that challenge also. There's another challenge. I, well, I don't think it was mentioned in pre a previous talk. Uh, I'm sure people know about it, but um, the challenge has to do with head rotation. If I record in real sound field with a binaural head, or you with your head, suppose I, I record with your head, and now do a perfect job at equalizing the headphones, so I take that out of the question, and I'm giving you your own HRTF coded binaural audio, you will he and we will hear good 3D. However, for not everybody, but for most people, if you start rotating your head, you will have a problem. You start believing less and less. We call that you know, less robustness for the reproduction, and to the point where some people will collapse back, that 3D image back to their head. Once Why? Because they start realizing that when they move their head, the sources are moving with them. And we all know that when we go to a concert hall and rotate our head, uh, Musicians refuse to stand up and move with us, no matter how, how much we do it. <laughs> so basically, you, when your brain realizes if something is not right, again, it's trying to protect you from the transducer, bang, the transducers are here, bang, collapses the 3D image. So headphones, binaural audio can be spectacular, but you have to do all these steps correctly. So I'll, I'll, I'll summarize them. You have to code with the HRTF of the listener, or ideally, or as close to it as possible, deliver. Uh, in, uh, through headphones that are equalized, of course the microphones have to be equalized, so everything has to be taken out, so we are reproducing as much as possible the sound pre pressure history in, that was recorded back at the interest of the ear canals. And then you have to worry about um, what I just said, which is uh, head rotation, which is impossible if you already recorded someone by no. Now, of course, if you are doing a virtual sound reproduction, you know where the sound sources are, you can uh, use head tracking and uh, uh, fix the image, but if you're not, you, you, if you're starting from an already recorded image, of course, that's a problem. However, there are ways to go around that too. Now, that's what I want to say for the time being about binaural um, headphones, and you've heard a lot about it from from different from the previous talk. So now, let's talk about what happens. Can we take that binaural audio? What does it take for us to make you hear the 3D sound field that was recorded, but through loudspeakers? Well, loudspeakers have one advantage: they're not very close to they're not close to your head. So the challenge of having the sound collapse inside your head is pretty much gone right off the bat, okay? As a matter of fact, this challenge of getting sound close to your head now, which is, not, which is no big deal headphones, is much bigger. So if I can get sound inside your head from two headphones, from two speakers, I, I must be doing something correct. The same way if I can get sound to appear coming very far away from headphones, I must be doing something correct. Um, so it's the opposite there, the challenge. Uh, but what's the problem with, headphone, with, with speakers? With speakers, um, the problem has to do first with what's called a crosstalk. To explain the crosstalk, I want to tell you something exact analog, uh, an exact analog story that goes back to the early, well, um, first half of the uh, 19th century. In 1834, a couple of years before the invention of photography, a gentleman figured out how to, uh, by the name of Wheatstone, in England, uh, figure out how to do imaging in 3D. Okay, so you all have seen this, uh, this uh, what's called a stereoscope. You can buy it, typically you can find it in uh, antique stores and so on, garage sales sometimes. That is uh, perfectly the same thing, uh, same principle as 3D movie, as I'll explain in a second. What, what uh, Wheatstone did, he said, okay, I wanna see in 3D, uh, I wanna, record and play back in 3D. Well, how can I do it? He closed his left eye, and he was a very good draftsman, and he made a drawing of a scene from the perspective of his right eye, and then he closed his right eye without changing anything, did the same drawing. The two drawings are slightly different because they're take, taken from slightly different vantage points. And then he presented them to the right and left ear. He said, I should look at 3D, and he didn't. I, could, I should see 3D because I'm presenting information to the right and left ear. He did not. He said, okay, what's going on? Ah, maybe I'm gonna focus my right eye more on the right image and the left eye on the left image because that information 
is intended only for each eye. The right drawing is made for the perspective of the right eye. It's not supposed to be seen by the left eye. That's called the cross-talk, cross-sight. That's the right to the left and the left to the right. So what he did, he put lenses, and on top of it, he put this wall. You see that wall? I don't know if there's a pointer here I can use, but uh, that wall, uh, is there a pointer I can use? It's not, if it's, not a big, it's not a big deal if you don't have one. But I will um, uh, just point to that little wall between, between the two uh, lenses. That's a crosstalk or cross-sight cancer. It stops the right eye from seeing in the left ear, uh, the left uh, picture, and vice versa. And that was a trick, and that was a patent. And that was the first stereoscope. As a matter of fact, when you go to a 3D movie, you put, you put glasses, you're doing nothing more than putting that wall, except it's done in a little fancier way by using polarized, uh, polarized glasses, uh, where the right eye shows you only one image. Uh, I mean, the right lens filters only one image, the one intended for the right eye, and the same thing for the left eye. So the stereoscope does what's called cross talk cancellation. Suddenly, your brain receives the cues, and suddenly, you see a 3D, your brain is satisfied by the cues and puts the object in 3D. That's how it works. It took um, three, four years only for uh, another British gentleman, Henry Fox Talbot, to invent uh, photography. And then, instead of doing things by hand, it, it, you can do it with a camera. So eventually, camera had, became, had two lenses, stereo cameras. And these are the same kind of cameras that you use to shoot movies, uh, 3D movies. The distance between the two cameras are roughly the interocular distance between the two eyes. And you're recording the perspective of both eyes. And 3D imaging has been around, as I said, since 1834. Uh, to play it back, you can do it this way, the, the, the 1834 method. Or the 2018 method, you can put, uh, you have a TV in front of you that, was, uh, uh, that is uh, completely synchronized with your um, <coughs> polarized glasses, and they do cross talk cancellation to a very high level, and you see right eye sees only the image intended for it. Both of the images are, are, are recorded by these two lenses, projected over each other, but through polarized colors on top of the screen. So you end up uh, with a cross talk canceller doing the job, making sure your right eye seeing uh, was intended for it only. 3D audio, in order for, if you take the binaural recording, and put it through speakers, which is an analog of taking a recording done with this camera. The problem is nothing stops, same exact problem, nothing stops the, right, the information from the right speaker from reach, reaching your left ear. That completely corrupts the ILD and ITD. What, what happens if I send a sound that is intended to come from all the way, at, suppose I, I want to make a click right here in, uh, in the left ear of uh, Ishmael's left ear. Ishmael is going to hear it there. Why? Because there's a very high ILD, something like 15 dB, if I come whisper in his, his ear. Why? Because his head is, is shadowing the, the other ear. So I need to reproduce from speakers something like 15 dB ILD for him to hear the sound there. However, that speaker can only put about 4 dB I, uh, I, uh, ILD. Why? Because if I stand right here and make a sound, and Ishmael is sitting right, may I ask you to sit right here? I'm going to use your head. <laughs> so uh, if you stand right here, and I, and I have a microphone I'm going to put in his ear in a minute, and I can send the sound from here. We can look at it if you want, but I won't spend time doing that. But trust me, if you measure it, it's about four, on the average, about 4 dB because uh, the sound, because, uh, because the, uh, the, the, nothing stops that from here being heard from here. So the difference between the right and left ear is not very large. However, if I want to reproduce from these two speakers, the sound right here. Somehow I have to find a way to get that speaker, the, those two speakers, to build that kind of ILD between the left and right ear. But if I play it right now, that binaural recording, he will just hear, if I make a sound right here, it will be mostly panned into, into the right speaker, he will hear the ILD of that speaker, which is 4 or 5 dB, and that's it. So he won't hear the sound escape from here. This is why with regular stereo, if we play binaural through two loud speaker, it's completely flat, it gets locked in the speaker. The only way you can make the sound move further than the speakers is if you take the speaker and put, put them apart. The fact that regular stereo, even though you, they use the words, no, can you please stay here? We're going to use you. <laughs> I'll stay right in front of you. The fact that regular stereo um, gives you an image that locks the speaker. This is why people say put the speakers plus or minus uh, 30 degrees, the regular uh, equilateral stereo triangle. That should give you a hint that 
uh, stereo is compromised is not, is not correct. The word stereo is it's not really well deserved for audio when it's used. The word stereo goes back to actually 16th century. It's been used, stereo is from Greek solid. It's used, it's used for 3D objects, for solid objects. So it's, been, it's correct to use it for stereoscopy. But for stereophony, since 1958, we call it 3D, but it's actually an image locked to the speakers. And if you take the two speakers, put them together, the whole image shrinks with them. That tells you there's something wrong with stereo. I will show you that when you do cost our cancellation, it doesn't matter where we put the speakers in, in a minute. You'll see that. OK, so to get 3D audio to work, it's clear that we have to stop the right uh, uh, speaker from reaching the left uh, ear and vice versa. So the, perf the perfect analog of, the, uh, of the, uh, the 3D imaging in 3D audio is to use uh, uh, Ishmael's head, much prettier than uh, Fritz right here. And then we will put uh, microphones in your ear. We're going to do a recording. And somehow we're going to put a, a, ma a mattress between the two speakers. And you can do that. You can go home, forget about cross-talk cancellation using computers. As I'm going to show you the programs that we have. You can um, take two speakers or your studio, put them close to each other. And if you're at home, you can do the same thing. And bring a mattress. And put the mattress between the two speakers. Of course, you might have to wait for your partner to be outside the house and to do that experiment. But put it there <laughs> and, and sit, and sit like, pretty much like this guy right there. And put that mattress between the two. That's a perfect analog of that uh, stereoscope right there. And you'll be surprised. You don't even have to play binaural. <laughs> uh, if you play anything that's acoustically recorded that has enough ILD, ITD, the image will be divorced from the speakers. You can put the speakers very close to each other. What, what are you doing? You're stopping the left speaker from, being, from reaching the right ear and vice versa. As long as the reflections don't dominate, so make sure the speakers are far away from, this is a great room. So this, this room has you know, pretty reflections, almost anechoic in, in a way from an early reflections point of view. So you can, if you do it right here, it'd be perfect. So if right now, if I put a mattress between the two, it'd be not perfect, but it'd be very good. Uh, Ishmael will hear, especially by no recording, he would hear a pretty good 3D sound field, irrespective of where the speakers are which is how it should be. So the challenge is, how can we do this without the mattress? OK, you know, people just sit with mattresses all, all day long. So, um, so basically, um, the idea is to uh, get rid of the mattress. Okay. All right, so before I show you how we get rid of the mattress, I'm going to stop the lecture part and spend five, 10 minutes using Ishmael's head <laughs> and his ears and his brain, hopefully, uh, to, uh, uh, to listen to what we can do uh, to, uh, to get a f make a f what's called a cross-talk cancellation fil filter. We're going to make one for him right now, individualized. This basically relies on measuring the HRTF. But we don't have to measure the entire HRTF. We only need to measure it only at these two points. And it's not really pure HRTF because it, it's going to have it's measured in a real room. Um, but this room is pretty dry. Uh, so we are measuring a very good approximation of the HRTF. Uh, this is almost you know, 1.5 meter or so. So this is a, a regular uh, far-field HRTF, practically. And you can do it. Uh, we can do it. But we only need to do it for two points. HRTF, as we heard today, is like 2,000 points, typically. But beca because the, the cross star cancellation filter only needs to know about Ishmael's head morphology from these two points only. Okay? So we only need to invert, so to speak, only two points of the HRTF. So how do we do this? So we have a software right here, which I'm going to show you a various feature of. Um, the software allows you to, OK, uh, here's Ishmael. And now, why is there other crosshair? Uh, trust me, there's nothing bad that's going to happen. Uh, the crosshairs are only to track his head. Because as I'm going to show you later on, we need to know where his head is to deliver the three, because the calculation of the filter are dependent on this listening spot which I will show you mathematically later on. Um, so we need to do some head tracking to locate his head. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is first ask him to wear these microphones. And since we use those microphones with someone else, for hygienic reasons, I always change the uh, earplugs to brand new ones. These can be clean in alcohol, the wrong size. And what we'll do, we're going to send, you heard earlier, uh, exponential sound sweeps. These will sweep, sweep sound from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz uh, quickly and uh, exponentially in such a way to maximize the signal to noise ratio. It allows us to decompose the impulse response, which the computer will on the fly use to calculate that mattress, that cross-talk cancellation filter. So I'm going to 
I'm not going to tell you how that, uh, right now how the uh, mattress is calculated. I will give that to the nerd portion of my talk later on when I show you how uh, the theory behind it. And there's a book that came out recently uh, called Immersive Sound that has a chapter on showing all the details of how, how this was, um, um, how you can do, derive such a filter, what the, basically what the software is doing. So what we're going to do is ask you if you can, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to create a crosstalk cancellation filter. Second, we are going to, um, yeah, the, the red one, uh, where he goes in the right ear, please worry, it's like a microphone. So uh, like an like a earphone. So plug your ear, ear canal with a plug. And I'm going to put him here in bin number three. So this software, all it does, it sends the sweeps. Well, all the, well, one, one module of it uh, is for making crosstalk cancellation filter. It's called Bach DSP. I'll be using it for the rest of my talk. Um, we, we are going to create a filter. What's going to happen, I'm going to send a exponential sound sweep from the left speaker, record in both ears. That's what happened when you measure HRTFs in an anechoic chamber. The same thing from this speaker. Uh, and then I'm going to ask him, uh, ask Ishmael to move his head and do it in three places. And I will get enough information to do a, uh, so I can track his head over the entire uh, area. So let's start from here. During the sweep, if you can please um, not make any noise or any, any sounds rather. So I'm going to turn on head tracking. Now I am going to please place head in center position and look straight. So please look straight. One, two, three. So I took uh, two measurements in the center. So Ishmael, if you can please uh, move your head like, like this. Like, yeah, not too much, yeah, yeah, yeah. go uh, until you are, that's it, look straight. Yeah, that's it, look straight like this. Very good, just stay like that. One, two, three. Very good. Uh, yeah, look straight, please. One, two, three. Bach measurements done. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So uh, as you see, the thermometer is going to now design a bunch of filter, a filter bank uh, interpolated. If, uh, actually, uh, um, I'm going to ask you to put them back, but since you cannot hear, and just wait a minute, and I'll, you're going to use your head to record. So what's happened, um, the, the software sent these sweeps, recorded the measurement, inverted the filter, and applied this theory that's, whose detail I'm going to give you a little overview of. Um, and produce what's called a crosstalk cancellation filter, which is that mattress I told you about, except it's an invisible mattress. I'll show you what the mattress is doing actually to the sound in a second. But the mattress job is to stop everything on the right channel to reach his right ear. And since, since that filter depends on where his, uh, uh, it's all about timing in these, uh, these impulses, um, you'll see the filter is made out of different direct delta functions that have to be timed correctly for the crosstalk cancellation to happen. That timing depends where his head is. This is why we did, did uh, measurement at three positions. This, and then we can track. For example, as you move, uh, can you move, tilt right, uh, your head right and left, and look what happens right here. See that? That cursor is, is uh, moving, and that selects the right, and does it, there's a 41 filters in this case, uh, spanning that entire, the entire uh, 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 width where, where his head, location where, where, where his head was. So as long as he, his head remains between the, the two red lines where we did the measurements, he's gonna have, Seamless 3D audio. The sweet spot will move with his head, so to speak. Now, talking about the sweet spot, I should say a few things about the sweet spot. You get to experience it later on. The sweet spot for these kind of filters is very interesting. It's, it's uh, quite tight. So if you, uh, can you look straight? So if um, the sweet spot is pretty uh, tight, had, uh, with no head tracking, if he moves his head more than three, four inches to the right and left, it will collapse. You will hear regular stereo. You won't, you won't hear in 3D. Now, if he moves, 
uh, if, I'm, if he moves back and forth, is actually very robust. Depending on the radiation pattern of speakers, it can be quite large. For omni speakers, it could be many, many feet. Uh, of course, they start degrading at, at um, higher frequencies at first, but generally speaking, uh, you can have very good 3D audio image for anybody behind them. So later on, when we do demos, uh, after I finish my talk, I welcome you to come here and listen. Now we can play diff different kind of music. Uh, you might, you will put chairs lined up behind each other so many people can hear th 3D audio. Except the person sitting here, whose head is being tracked, is going to be the captain, the boss. When uh, he or she moves her head, everybody have to have to follow them because uh, the, <laughs> the sweet spot, uh, the sweet spot will, will uh, move with them. Okay, so let me now do a test, okay? So we, we have here a measurement on the right-hand side of the cross star cancellation. It's pretty large. It's 18 dB. With 18 dB on the average, uh, that means I can, should be able to whisper in his ear from these two speakers. Um, and let's see how good it is. Um, so I, I'm going to ask you to put your, um, the microphones in the ear. I'll, I'll explain later on some of the measurements. But let's listen to the filter. I'm going to turn on this um, uh, simple recorder. This is, I call it binaural recorder. It's only binaural because the microphone is binaural. It's nothing but a two-channel recorder. I'm going to go to file two. I'm going to arm and when record. What I'll do, I'm going to walk around. And please, Ishmael, look straight all the time. And do not say anything. Because if you say something, when you play it back, it will be very strange. It will appear inside your head. Uh, and it will be kind of jarring. It's pretty much like when you wear headphones and you hear sound uh, more inside your head. So I'm going to arm right now. And I will start here at uh, center stage, 12 o'clock. <laughs> Moving to 11 o'clock, oh, pretty much behind the speaker, the left speaker. Now I'm going to 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Now I'm going to come and get closer to you, closer closer and whispering, left ear, testing. I'm going to go behind you to about uh, 3 o'clock. I'm going to come and whisper in your right ear, whisper. I'm going now to 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock, back to 12 o'clock. Could you please take off the microphones? And we're going to do is play you back right away what I recorded. I'm going to walk around to see if the, uh, what you're hearing matches my visual cues. Um, and then um, you let us know what you hear. I'll start here at uh, center stage, 12 o'clock. Moving to 11 o'clock. Pretty much behind the speaker. Okay. Now, of course, how was that? Incredible. Hey. <laughs> okay, so it's extremely accurate for him, but some people are going to wonder what the fuss is about there. All you, <laughs> all you heard is uh, regular stereo. But what, what Ishmael heard is pretty much the sound field that I recorded, back from two speakers, including me whispering in his right ear. And we just met, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, um, you get to experience that later on. Now, of course, you might wonder what happens if I, if I do a recording with his head, uh, the filter with his head, and somebody else listens. And you'd be surprised. It's actually very, very good. Uh, not perfect, but actually quite good. Why? It's because we are talking about only two points in the HRTF, which happen to be the azimuthal plane plus or minus 30 degrees. And humans have not much variation. In that, you remember we we saw plus of variation between humans and HRTF, uh, and that helps this what we call the cross star cancellation filter, which happens to be called a Bach filter, which I will describe to you why later on it's called Bach filter. That Bach filter to to be very um, uh, universal, 
the spike was made with his head, it will work for all. So I'm, I don't have to do redo the filter for everybody's head. You will see that I can do it for you. It takes only two minutes, as you saw. But, um, but we'll play later on music with Ishmael's head, which everybody's going to hear 3D. Because had, had the speakers been elevated at different angles, then everybody's back filter or cross the cancellation filter will be different. But because the calibration, or rather the filter, was made with these speakers in the azimuthal plane, plus or minus 30 degrees, the Bach filter is very robust, very quite universal. Okay. Uh, having said this now, I'm, I'm going to play a couple of things, uh, just a couple of songs recorded by Norley, and, uh, uh, and then say a few things about the property of this filter and how it works. Okay. So here I have some binaural music recorded uh, in nice uh, spaces in New York City. And this is from the Chesky Record Collection. The Chesky Records is a hi-fi, high-end audio label that makes very good binaural recordings for with uh, nice artists. Um, <laughs> location of the sound very accurately, like, like during my recording. But he's also listening to the ambiance of that room. Unfortunately, this room doesn't have much of ambiance, not much of a reverb. This was recorded in a nice church in Brooklyn, um, and it has a beautiful ambiance. And he will hear from the two speakers. The if we, rec we have another recording done, in, for example, in a church in, on Broadway, a big cathedral, uh, St. Paul the Apostle, and that has a huge reverb tail, about four seconds. And he'll hear it, right? In this anechoic chamber, he will hear it coming from all around. There's no need for surround speakers, because his brain, ear system, are getting all the cues, including the, the, uh, the cues needed to get um, the ILD, ITD spectral cues are so satisfied that the reverb tail of that room, which consists of a um, mixture of thermalized, so to speak, uh, late reflections that have extension for many seconds, well, he would perceive them. Therefore, he would put them in space. He will hear uh, the entire reverb of the room from, from uh, somebody plays the organ. He will reverberate around the, around the church. So that becomes a church, despite the fact that it's anechoic. So the advantages are clear that um, you can, from two speakers, you can get um, 3D audio through with the binaural format to two people if you do crosstalk cancellation correctly. So the first thing I want to say a uh, few words about how cross cancellation is done. That's the rest of my talk. How cross cancellation actually works. Um, how am I able to put that invisible mattress? What goes on into the filter? What, what is the filter doing for that to happen? Second, tell you about some of the um, challenges that have to be met. Okay, and this is still a single listener person or many a row of this and that's not very practical to require people to sit in a row so uh, also a solution for that using what's called phase arrays now we can project sound to many different people in the room using phase arrays and i'll describe that in a few minutes and then i'm going to say a few words about the importance of uh you know um which i already said about a little bit about the importance of um, um individualizing the filter so first thing I want to explain, before we come back to the music, uh, what the filter is doing. So this, this part, again, I, uh, this is the part I give to uh, an AES audience. Uh, I know here we have a mixture of people who are technically um, savvy and more people on the creative side, artistic, and, and so on. So I'm not going to expect the, uh, the detail. I'm going to just give you the caricature of this AES talk. So this is the nerd part of my, my talk. And I will, uh, don't, don't worry about the equations. I'm going to get to the plots. And I'm going to show you what went. And then, of course, the detail come from, from our, in this book. I don't get a penny from this book, so I'm not advertising it for financial reasons. But it's a good book to have for uh, reviewing all kinds of problems in immersive audio. Uh, this is published by, uh, it's by uh, AES, actually, <laughs> uh, through uh, Rutledge. And um, it just came out a few months ago. And has a bunch of people who work in, the, in these fields talk about uh, and giving introductions and giving 
a lot of depth also into any, anything from wave synthesis to binaural audio to uh, ambisonics, including a crosstalk cancellation. And the gory detail of what I'm showing you is in that, is in that chapter, chapter five. But what, what goes on? Well, it turns out that you can, uh, uh, to get this to work like it did. And by the way, something very important I didn't mention is that uh, crosstalk cancellation has been around for a long time, since 1961. People have known that uh, you, know, you, you need to put a mattress. And since 1961, people have been trying to avoid the mattress by doing crosstalk cancellation using analog circuits and uh, canceling phase and so on. Um, the, the, the main uh, breakthrough, or the main problem until a few years ago, was that any crosstalk cancellation filter inherently colors the sound. That's total distortion. So this is why you haven't heard of crosstalk cancellation, for most of you, probably, because until recently, it was a lab curiosity. It was something you would go to somebody's lab who was doing research in that field. He'd play for you some binaural audio through, like I just did, and you'd be impressed, except it sounds awful. What I, what I didn't do right now is bypass the filter. So let me do that before I go f further. I'm going to play the same song I was playing for Ishmael. And as I, um, as I play it, I'm going to remember we did his filter in bin number three. I'm going to push on bypass. Bypass completely bypasses the filter. And he will hear regular stereo. So the image will collapse bang into these two speakers. Okay? So that, that's the first thing. And I want, want you to see if you hear anything. Um, so I'm going to play. <laughs> Bypass. Everywhere I go. Now let me tell you, you heard a huge difference between 3D and bang into the speakers. Those of you who are not on this line, most of you are not. You didn't hear much difference at all between, actually, if, you, if I give you a blind test without that click between them, you won't be able to tell between bin, a, uh, bin three and bypass. That means the filter is not doing anything totally to the sound. And that is the only breakthrough uh, that, that, well, that's the main breakthrough that allowed it to become use, uh, uh, useful for commercially, so to speak. As a matter of fact, this is a, a patent that my university has for, for um, making tonally colored, um, tonally co uh, totally uncolored or transparent crosstalk cancellation filter. It's the third most successful um, patent in the history of my university, despite the fact that it has to do with consumer uh, audio and, and audio in general. You'd think a drug would, do, would, would be more successful. But the po point is that it's, it maybe rendered a technique that was very promising, but flawed, uh, available, I mean, um, it rendered it quite um, useful because it removed the tonal, the tonal coloration. So I just showed you that when I turn on the filter on and off, all that happened is he got 3D image, and, with that, and when I turn it on, there was no price. There was no tonal distortion. Any crosstalk cancellation filter before that will, will cause severe tonal distortion for reasons I'm going to tell you in a second. So. The, that problem, how to do crosstalk cancellation with that tonal distortion, is, as I said, is documented in this chapter, can be understood if you model the problem as a point source. Okay? So uh, here is, um, I'm going to show you over, over this view graphs right here, uh, what happens how, when uh, engineers, mathematicians, or physicists model the problem. They may make it very idealized. So this is how a human head looks to a, 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 a an acoustician, just a circle, a uh, theor theoretician ra rather, uh, with a nose right there and two ears. As a matter of fact, this model, to, we start without any head being there, just the distance between the two heads, will represent the uh, loudspeaker by a point source. Why? Because with point source, you can write mathematically exactly how, it, how sound radiates from a point source using this mathematical equation that in the frequency domain that tells you how sound radiates from a point, R is the distance from the head, and so on. So again, don't worry about the math, but trust me, this is all straight, uh, for anybody who knows acoustics, this is very straightforward. You can just model how sound from two um, point sources, meaning two loudspeakers, the two loudspeakers standing in front of Ishmael here, uh, can be, we can write an equation that tells us what the pressure, PL and PR, of the sound that uh, combined pressure from both left loudspeaker that, that uh, builds up at what well, that occurs at his left ear and the same thing as the right ear. We can write an equation for that. 
Now, the, the problem, I'll, I'll, and these are also some definitions for geometry I won't bore you with. You need to define angles, distances, and so on. But when you write all the equations, uh, the problem becomes how to put a filter, which is, this is the crosstalk constitution filter, to process the sound, that's DSP, so to speak, before you send it to the speakers, such that only the signal coming to the left speaker, only the, the signal on the left channel, appears at his left ear. Okay? And that can be posed mathematically by saying that I want, I want a signal coming into the left speaker and the right speaker uh, to go through a, uh, uh, a filter first and, and go through space and end up separated, crossed or canceled, so to speak. So again, this can be done mathematically. And the H is the filter. You want to, this, the signal is the signal I recorded earlier, the binaural signal that I recorded with his head. I wanted to go to a, a, a filter H yet to be determined. The filter H sends the, the speaker, send the uh, signal to the speakers. The speakers then do their own thing by radiating into space. And somehow, when these signals, as they were filtered, arrive here, all the part that's on the right, left channel will be canceled at the right channel. To do that, you, you, in, uh, you actually you can show that you need to invert that transfer function between the speaker and the ears. So this is, again, details. What I'm going to show you is that after you go through the whole math, you get a filter. This is the actual filter okay, from inversion. This is, again, for people who, who are familiar with this kind of math. Uh, the filter has a response. And you can look at the response in the time domain or the frequency domain. Let's look at plus. Plus are more informative than the actual uh, here. This plot is very important. This plot will explain how on Earth I can, was able to whisper in Ishmael's ear. Okay? Remember, if I came and whisper or make a click in his left, in his left ear, if I play it to a regular speaker, it's going to come from that speaker only. If I record binaurally, play from this. Why? Because uh, the speaker uh, uh, is, has been heard by both ears, so therefore the ILD that he's perceiving is the ILD of the speaker, mostly. So he puts the sound right here. What the filter does, which is our invisible mattress, so to speak, it does the same effect as the invisible mattress, but it does it digitally. What it does, it sends the first, uh, this is the time domain. So these are time and this is amplitude. And that's the actual time response of the filter. In other words, this is exactly what that filter inside the computer is doing to the sound in real time all the time. So let's say I've recorded a click in the left ear. These are, it's called, it's a train of impulses. Uh, mathematically, they're called Dirac delta functions. They're, they're a train of deltas. The first delta is sent at time zero from the left speaker. That goes, that's my click or my whisper. It arrives right here. Now, if the, world st if the time stops here, if nothing happens, then Ishmael will hear the sound right here. But nothing is stopping that wave from reaching his right ear. And this is why he's going to hear the speaker, but we don't want to read the speaker. So what does the filter do to stop him from hearing the speaker? The filter will send the negative, same exact sound, but negative phase, uh, from the right speaker. Just delayed exactly that delta t, the delayed fair amount of uh, microseconds, to arrive on the right ear at the same time that uh, a wave that we want to cancel the right ear arrives at the right ear. And when the two waves, one positive phase, the other one, the opposite phase, meet each other, they cancel each other, annihilate each other. That's called destructive interference. And we get silence. And then again, if the time stops here, he will hear the sound as it left ear as intended. However, we have a problem. Because nothing stops this uh, positive wave, a uh, negative wave rather, to reach his, right, uh, his, his uh, uh, left ear and mess up the whole thing for us again. So we need to stop that one too, and on and on and on every time. If not, we're, not, we're going to hear the speakers. But if we cancel all of them, except the first one, he will hear the click right here. And the filter does that by sending, uh, again, after a, a certain amount of time, which depends on the geometry, a positive or negative impulse timed correctly to arrive at the, at the other ear, or the, uh, called the ipsilateral or, or contralateral ear, to destroy what's getting there acoustically. And this is why we need to know where his head is. If he moves his head, we have to do this destruction with a different delay. Okay? But only when we do this, everything gets killed. And the only thing that survives is that first impulse. 
and bang, Ishmael gets the right ILD, finally, to put the sound right here. Luckily, we don't, um, every time we do one of these killing impulses, so to speak, we have to do it at a little less volume because sound has already been attenuated by going through his head. So we don't need as much amplitude to kill them. That means that we don't need to go at, and for infinity. We need to do it only because it decays almost exponentially, as you see. Um, it decays quickly. And we only need to do it uh, up, what, down to a point where it goes into, into the noise floor. It turns out to be only on the order of about 200 impulses. So even at 40, 48 uh, kilohertz or uh, 41, 44.1 kilohertz, even, uh, even lower, you won't hear any of the impulses. The, the, your brain cannot resolve things until you get on the order of, of um, uh, tens of milliseconds. So basically, we are talking about an, something acoustically, the equivalent of blocking what's which is that mattress, what's on the left ch channel to reaching your right ear, is done completely by um, uh, a digital filter. Now, the problem is that this digital filter has horrible f uh, frequency response. So what I've shown you is the time response of the filter. If you take a Fourier transform of that filter, this is what you get. And that's horrible. That, uh, that is peaks of 34 dB. Okay, um, and that's that. Why? Well, it turns out, without going to the details, that when you have when you're trying to cancel something in space by sending waves, depending on the frequencies for that location, it could be that the waves that uh, will uh, uh, waves from two points will have destructive interference. That depends on the frequency and the location. Meaning, when the way, like when you throw two pebbles on the surface of a pond, you get surface waves. And you can see when they start meet, so some points where the, when the, the two waves are opposing each other, one has a crust, uh, when, when another one has a valley, one has a crest, one has a valley, they, they kill each other. They, when you sum them, they get, you get nothing. And that's, that's called destructive interference. And what happens is when you have destructive interference, you have to, uh, in, order, in order to boost the amplitude there, uh, in order to do something with the cost of cancellation, you have to boost the amplitude. This, this is this, uh, mathematically this is due to the inversion. When you invert something with a low number, you get a peak like this. And we heard uh, earlier that something by regularization. Regularization is a mathematical technique to deal with these uh, uh, frequencies where you have ill conditioning, where things blow up, so to speak. But uh, even with regularization, you're going to have very high uh, peaks that amount to coloration which you haven't heard, because that filter that I showed you doesn't have that problem. But that's like, if you put a, a piano through this, it would sound like a xylophone, roughly. Uh, maybe a flute would sound like a clarinet or something, but it would, it would distort the sound. This is why crosstalk cancellation had a big problem. So the technique that's described in the chapter uh, deals, finds a way of dealing with, the, with these frequencies. The reason why he hears these, even though the filter is designed to be perfect, in reality, th this is the response of the filter. But he's not listen he listened to the response of the filter from a distance. He's listening to, to the actual result, which should be, in principle, perfect, because the inversion mathematically was perfect. We call that, I call that a perfect filter. But the perfect filter is, only works in a perfect world, because as soon as Ishmael moves his head infinitesimally, the, you, he starts hearing this spectrum. Because one can show mathematically that the, at these ill-conditioned frequencies, uh, the uh, filter robustness become, goes to zero. In other words, the filter collapses for infinitesimal movement of his head. The bottom line is that at these frequencies, the filter, uh, uh, he will hear the coloration of the filter even though he's not supposed to. So the method that we came up with, um, I'm not going to go through the math, math detail of it, in, it actually relies on introducing imperfection which is a bit like a like regularization we heard about early on. But the, we do it in a very forceful manner. We actually use a lot of error, by f which will force all the correction to the phase domain. You end up doing, uh, I mean, force all the cross cancellation to the phase domain. You end up hearing absolutely no coloration. This is what happens when I give you the AB. So I'm not going to walk you through that in detail, but just to tell you that um, by optimizing the, this regularization, we can obtain uh, any level of uh, coloration, we can cut those peaks and we can go completely to a flat spectrum without paying any price. Um, we, we end up paying a price for cross cancellation, but it turns out that humans need only 20 dB of cross cancellation to hear in 3D. So we can end up 
paying that price from infinity, which is a perfect filter, down to 20 dB, and flatten the frequency response. And that's the key to a filter that we call the Bach filter. So the Bach filter, is, uh, this is the perfect filter, and this is called the Bach, Bach filter. Uh, and the Bach filter, those of you who know about uh, digital filtering will know that this is, uh, looks like a non-causal filter. It starts uh, doing its work before time equal to zero. And it doesn't, now it's hard to explain. This one is easy to explain what it's doing. Here, it's not only trying to do crosstalk cancellation, it's trying to do crosstalk cancellation and keep the frequency response completely flat. And this is why it sounds great. It sounds as good as no filter. All right. So we heard the final result. Uh, these are the equations that goes in, into programming the filter. And these are, you need 10 equations and two loudspeaker. <laughs> we call that Bach, because Bach is uh, band assembled crosstalk cancellation hierarchy. And that is uh, the Bach filter. And that software I just showed you um, allows you to design a Bach filter. So what we've done here, when we put microphones in this here, and um, made the filter, we just did that, that inversion using actual measurement, produced a filter using this technique that has no color, uh, uh, no, no um, uh, coloration. Now you can see here the crosstalk cancellation spectrum. And the higher, the better. And you can see it's, it's very much around 15 dB. 15 dB was put sound right here, very close to his ear. Um, you know, 20 dB or so is enough to put the sound inside your head. So uh, the frequency response, this is the frequency response, not of the filter, but of, of Ishmael's head. That's the HRTF that we heard about for, Ishma, for, uh, for uh, Ishmael for these two points. You can see his pinna. Have, if I put my, my, as a matter of fact, here we have somebody else before, one of the uh, technician gentlemen here helped me set up. This is his, his HRTF. You can see how different it is. See that? This is his, and this is uh, Ishmael's. It changes. Uh, this is the impulse response. And you can see in that, in that room, this is left to left. Uh, it's pretty damp. That, that most of these excursions are due to the inertia of this general uh, speaker. But after that, aside from the small reflection, which I think it's probably the floor. <coughs> There's not much reflection. It's such a good filter because of, it's also as, uh, practically an echoic. So th this software allows you to also tweak the filter if you need to, but it's already set to optimize. But it has many other modules. And I'm going to spend the last uh, few minutes here uh, showing you some of the modules. Now that we can get stereo out of uh, a good 3D image out of stereo through cross cancellation, might as well um, explore uh, creating a binaural content and send it to the speakers. So this software has a mixer. The mixer uh, allows you to create binaural content. Uh, instead of having a recording, uh, needing an actual head and microphones, we can do the whole thing through uh, emulation. I mean, through, uh, through a convolution with an HRTF. So right here is a head, OK? And there's a room which has green walls. And there are now five. Uh, you know, five uh, sources right here, which I can put anywhere I want in, in 3D space. Uh, this here is, an, is a head which I can uh, load a sofa uh, uh, HRTF. So if you come to my lab, we'll make, we'll make a measurement of your HRTF uh, in a few minutes, and then you'll have, you'll, you can upload it in sofa format, and that becomes your head. That head right there acoustically become. Uh, right now, I have um, a library of uh, some of my students. The first one we call uh, Johan Sebastian is actually the KMAR, the KMAR head we heard about before. So, this is the HRT of the KMAR head uh, right now, but I can change it to anything I want. And um, these are walls of the room. I can change the walls uh, width, height, and depth. And that will in real time calculates the um, reflections and the reverb in real time. The, uh, and I can hear here's a reflection and here's a reverb. If I, if I turn them off, it becomes an anechoic environment. If I turn them on, I have a room. I can also change the material of the room, uh, of the walls. Each wall can be made from a different material. So you can, you can basically change the room dimension, a room uh, wall material. And, uh, and then in real time, you can mix and send it through a crosstalk cancel filter, and here, completely in 3D from your speaker. And let's see how realistic it can be. Um, as it comes up, I'm going to show you this module, and then uh, we'll um, 
I'll take some questions. Actually, I can take some questions while this is coming up, and we'll come back to the demo afterwards. So um, I'll stop right here for a few minutes and take some questions uh, first. Yes, please. Are the HRTFs you were just talking about before it died, uh, are those like full HRTFs, or are those like the ones that you just No, that, these are full HRTFs, because that, you want to put the sound everywhere in 3D. In here, I want to reproduce the sound from only two speakers. So only need, uh, these two uh, impulse responses, so to speak, uh, which is only two points of the entire HRF, uh, HTRF, um, uh, HRTF. But ha however, um, uh, to put sound anywhere in 3D space, you need the full HRTF. Right. Right. The ones that we have in our lab is limited in the sense that we don't have, uh, uh, we don't have speakers under the floor. So you won't be able to pan sound under, under the floor. Luckily, that's not very often something you want to do. Yes, yes. I actually have two questions. Thanks for this beautiful demonstration. Um, the first question is, what's your experience with the distance of the speakers we know from Takeuchi and, and Philip Nelson? Yes. Is there a dipo and the different speakers? So your inversion? Your yes, yes, yes. The problem will have different regularization. And how well in fact filters deal with this problem that we've been facing? Yes, actually, we did a lot of study on, um, uh, basically, um, uh, he's referring to, to uh, work done at University of Southampton where uh, early work across the cancellation where they found that there's advantage of having the speakers very t touching each other. Um, it turns out that's mostly the advantage that will help to give you a more stable, you can show that, uh, uh, that that configuration called the dipole configuration gives you more stable um, uh, more robust, higher robustness for head movements. So you can move your head a little bit more before you start losing the cross cancellation than you would if the speaker have a higher span. But it turns out it has a lot of other problems. If you put this dipole, uh, if you, in a dipole situation, for center pan images, you'll have a, a, a singularity, um, uh, which is a center image will have a, a low frequency roll off, which gets worse and worse as the span gets smaller. So the price to pay. However, this is before head, uh, this is before head tracking. With head tracking, the advantage of this configuration is, uh, is not anymore anything. Uh, it's not an advantage anymore, and uh, so we don't have. We have. There's no preference whatsoever. Okay. As a matter of fact, we prefer not. Uh, uh, if you put the, the speakers very close to each other, you have to deal with that uh, coloration with this, of a center image. We have a setting called dipole setting, which will lift it, but at the price of dynamic range loss because any uh, you're doing equalization. So uh, the pre the preferred the preferred uh, lo location is. Um, any location, but uh, most people want to AB the system, so we, we tell them start with your stereo, regular stereo, and leave it there. I should, I'm glad you brought up the uh, situation of uh, the question of uh, uh, speaker lo location. This is something a little bit shocking for when people hear about it first, but we can do the experiment later on and see it for yourself. I just chose this location. Had I taken those speakers and made them touch each other, like, like uh, our speaker was, uh, was uh, mentioning, or put one here and one there, or one here, one there, or it doesn't matter where, as long as the reflections are not playing a role, which are not playing in this room, we get the same sound image. He will hear me whispering in his ear. He will hear me, you know, whatever I am in this room. Because the speaker, once you design a, this is a, once you design a filter, but once you design a filter, you cannot move the speaker anymore. If you use the speaker, the image will, be, will get messed up. But for each location of the speaker, to a zeroth order, where the, where the reflections are not playing a role, the image is the same, which is nice because you can put the speakers <laughs> whatever you want. Uh, that shows you that the speakers are now are not doing anything. Their location has nothing to do with the cues uh, of locating sound. It's this locoding that has these cues. And cross star cancellation done properly will allow the cues to reach your brain, the cues of the, where the, uh, the sound sources were in 3D, 3D space, not, not of, the, of the speakers, okay? So, um, uh, yeah, but you had another question? Yeah, just a second question. Sure. Um, since you use head tracking, um, so I was wondering if you, because stereo dipole, not stereo, trans are all reproduction falls apart when you turn the head. Yes, yes, thanks. So if you're using adaptive filters um, for taking care of this, or if you have any experience with using multi speaker setups, which have been proposed in literature as well, can you swap over speakers while turning the head? Yes. Yes, we, we actually, very good question again. I think, that, so just to uh, summarize the question is that um, uh, I am here tracking head translation, left and right, okay? What about if this uh, user, um, uh, user uh, or the listener uh, rotates uh, his or her head? 
Now what happens, at some point, the cues will be wrong, and then the image will collapse, again, 3D. And there are different ways of uh, tracking that. One of them is you can track head rotation, which we do, we can do, for, we do that for our speaker technology, our headphones technology, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, so in principle, when you, you could then rotate, uh, track the head rotation and then compensate for that. We can do a measurement for head rotation, one for head translation, and this can be done. Or it can also be done by additional speakers, both of which add complication. But we, we realized, we found out that actually, when people listen, seriously at least, to music or computer or TV, or they seldom listen like this, okay? So the complication of doing this, all this can be done, uh, is not warranted to, for, to a zeroth order again. And um, so mo we don't, uh, we, don't uh, we haven't implemented in this software head rotation for, list for, head for speaker. But we can do head rotation tracking, and I'll show you. Uh, it does it very beautifully from the camera. Uh, we do it for, for our, our uh, headphones technology, because remember what I told you about headphones. And headphones, if, you do, if we don't do head rotation, um, the image will collapse for 70% of people, roughly, in your head. So, um, so to answer your question, we don't do, uh, we only do translation, head tracking, for speaker, but not for, for head. You know, no, we haven't. Again, that's more complication. The idea is to, is to stick with two speakers. Again, the, uh, the, this is concentrated on, on a two speaker system. No, no, it's, yeah. it's beautiful. Okay. It's, no, no, it's, yeah. it's very interesting as we meet the four that are doing a lot of research. It's cave applications, because in cave applications, you normally have the problem. They can put speakers because you have all the video streams, everything. Yes. And so they use a lot of transoral tracking people. And there is the situation that when you're in a cave, you walk around. Object. Yes. So you turn your head around. Yes. You find yeah, problems, of course. Yeah. yeah. This is most for traditional mastering, yeah. uh, listening, sitting in front of a computer and so on. But absolutely. But these uh, solutions are just a matter of, I mean, practical solutions. There are practical solutions for, for, for these challenges. They are pretty effective. Head tracking can be done. Of course, things can, if you want to track somebody walking around, that's another issue. Okay. So uh, the 3, 3D mixer is um, a virtual environment. Uh, that has a lot of technologies in it, uh, including, th there's no real uh, mystery right there. We're doing convolutions with uh, HRTFs. Uh, the, the closer the HRTF to you, the more realistic it is. And then we're sending the output to, we can either bypass and print it as a binaural recording, then you listen to headphones, or we can send it to a Bach filter, listen to it in, uh, in 3D. Okay. So now, um, I let me launch the uh, mixer again, which is command three. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, so this mixer, okay, this mixer has um, a room, as I said, and it has walls. We can, I was, I was showing you that for each wall, I can change the material. This is the right wall. I can change all the materials right now. I'm gonna put them all wood, okay? And um, I'm going to dial a room. The dimension now are about two meter uh, radius of that room. Now I can move anything. I can move the location of each. For example, this, this uh, red dot, I can move it anywhere I want. This is uh, azimuth. This is elevation, up and down. You can see now it's up in the room. See it? And uh, a radius, I can make it get closer to the head, like this. How close to the head? Well, I can make it very close to the head, like inside the head. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can see it here, inside, it's actually inside the head. <laughs> yeah. And I can, I can take it like this and take it out. <laughs> so uh, you can zoom out. Um, let's zoom out a little bit. And then uh, let's play some music. Now, now these, each of these sources can be associated with a bus. This could be a bus coming from Pro Tools or Logic Pro or whatever. Um, this is not a plug-in, but it can, it's a, uh, uh, this is application, Bach TSP can be launched as a, as a standalone application, but you can bring in the audio through these buses. Or you can play a multi-track up to 20 sources. I have 20 sources here. I can uh, load, I'm going to load right now a, uh, a multi-track audio. And uh, it's right here under demos, multi-track audio. It's an a cappella quartet. And here is the one, two, three, four. There are four singers. Um, and then I have a preset for this particular, I'm gonna hear those in my bank of presets. And you can see here, when I click on that button, I get into this room. One more click. Here we go. 
Um, now the room is too size, that's why the head is too small. I can make the, the head manual, this is purely visual, so you can see the head. So I'm gonna make it like this. And you can see here this base, this guy is the base, the, the black, the black uh, dot. The red dot is the lead singer, and that's the tenor, and that's the baritone. So I'm gonna ask Ishmael to, you know, to listen again and give us his impression. Later on, you can sit yourself. Just wanna make sure I still have audio here. So um, let me play uh, something here to make sure we have, okay, maybe it's a little bit too loud. Good. It's working. Uh, this is working. This is also working. You hear somebody here? Okay. Very good. All right. So now, uh, remember that we earlier heard something about also prox uh, proximity. Um, let me see. Uh, a previous speaker mentioned uh, the, difficult, the challenge of getting near field uh, HRTF to work correctly. And that's, that's quite, quite challenging, especially with speakers, because the speakers remember the challenge to get sound very close to you. Now, if when I recorded it with his head, I had his HRTF, everything was perfect, everything was re uh, realistic. But now I'm doing everything uh, uh, virtually. So um, we spent quite a bit of time to get the near field HRTF, which we don't have, because when you measure HRTF, as we heard earlier, it becomes very difficult to measure the near field. First, it changes a lot. Second, as we heard, you cannot use any speakers anymore. You have to use small, tiny speakers or small, do the inverse and use microphones, put the speakers in the dummy head. So it becomes a difficult. So we don't have HRT, most HRTF, all, practically all HRTF in libraries are far field HRTFs. So how do we get the sound close to him here? So we, we do that uh, using a trick by uh, trend, using for the near field a spherical model of the head because you can solve um, the pressure distribution on a, on, a on a spherical head, it's called a spherical head model, and we can do interpolation in real time to the spherical model, and um, which will uh, replicate the ILD that you get when you get near field. It turns out, turns out to be very realistic, and we'll, we'll let Ishmael tell us if he believes it or not. So I'm going to turn the mixer on. I'm going to turn uh, all the speakers, all these singers off, except for the lead singer first. I'm going to put the lead singer right here. So somewhere, somewhere there, okay? Yeah, are, you, are you seeing there too? Okay. And I'm gonna play and move him around first and then we'll add the other guys and we'll play with them. So uh, let's uh, go here and let's play this multi-track. You can hear, this is by the way recorded, uh, recorded with uh, cardioid mics, not isolated. So you're gonna hear leakage of the other singers but mostly one singer at a time. Now I'm gonna take the singer, move him here, move him behind, move him here. And now I'm gonna get him come and whisper in his ear, or get closer to his ear. How believable was that? Very, okay. So now um, we put it right here, I put the other guys. Very dry. I can make it very wet with the uh, concrete walls. Let's make it out of wood. I can make them come very close to you. Or go very far. Sorry. I can make them turn around. I can get dizzy. Dizzy. make the room very large. This is to scale. No, this is to scale. <laughs> you get the idea. So you can control now everything. Uh, okay. Was that realistic? Yeah. Okay. Actually, it added, added distance that I couldn't get the rear cues. Yes, well, the rear cues, as we know, we heard it before, are the toughest part because uh, even in real life, 
if I stand, if I do an experiment, um, if you close your eyes and we put two people in front, behind you, in front of you, and we make sounds, you'd be surprised how many of us would get confused uh, because of the lack of uh, visual. We, we have a vision field that is only frontal, and um, we rely on our hearing for the back, and f back frontal is uh, f called the front back confusion is very difficult. Uh, to get even even without uh, audio, with audio, I mean, even without uh, uh, audio technology, with, with audio technology, you have the HRTF has to be perfect, and even then you will have some problem as we heard uh, uh, earlier. Um, so, but uh, still, uh, if you have the right cues, you can have, you can believe that somebody is behind you, especially. But the circling from close. Was from very close is very realistic. That's correct. Yes. From a distance, it was a bit. Yes. Well, actually, from a distance, it's hard to tell anyway because yeah. you're getting mostly diffuse sound. And diffuse sound doesn't contain any of these localization cues. So uh, that's what happens in real life. If I put you in a big church and people are running around you, you cannot tell where they are very, very well. Okay? Because the ratio of direct to reflected sound becomes very low. You, you're mostly uh, listening to diffuse field. So before I finish, I, I, um, yeah, before I take more questions, I want to show you one more module, which I haven't set up yet, and I can show it to you later on. Now, this, is, this allows you uh, to, uh, let me stop the, these guys going around. Um, this now allows you to, to put sound whatever you want in, in 3D space. Of course, you can put up to 20. You can also sim simulate the 5.1 surround sound, a 7.1 surround sound system, or you can uh, simulate a Atmos, it's an Atmos system, and this is a, you know, like a hour 3D. So basically, if you have an Atmos uh, mix, you can put it into those channels, and then listen to it from here, and you will hear it pretty much where, where it was, but from two speakers. You don't need to buy 13 speakers anymore. It, they're emulated. Um, you can change the room that it's in, and if you have your own HRTF, it's pretty much indistinguishable, and if you have high cost of cancellation, it's really like having a 17 point, uh, whatever, 14.1 14, 14 uh, you know, speaker system. Now that we can put speakers without paying a penny around the room, we can take advantage of that mixer and use higher or ambisonics to solve that problem I mentioned earlier, which is the fact that if we, if Ishmael, um, if Ishmael uh, does a recording with his own head, he cannot sell it to anyone, He's, especially the fact he doesn't even have a twin brothers, so he doesn't have much of a market. But if you do it generically and specialize it for everybody, everybody can hear binaurally, right? So how can this be done? It be done. Well. This can be done with the help of uh, ambisonics. As you, ambisonics was invented by uh, a wonderfully inventive uh, mathematician called Michael Gerzon in Oxford uh, in the 60s or so, with the intention of playing back through loudspeakers and reconstructing sound through loudspeakers. It's been on the shelf for many years because not many people can afford making a sphere of speakers and amplifiers and cables. And it's been, it's been on the shelf tinkered uh, with, with some people until about five, 10 years ago when the AR, VR started becoming uh, very important. And now we can do everything virtually. So what I can do, I can take this microphone, which is a, an eigen mic you, you heard about yesterday um, from Jensen, and you can take it and uh, plug it into this software. And there's a module here. Uh, it's called HOA Renderer. Here is, and you can see the eigen mic right here. Um, there's another mic called Zillia which is uh, quite cheaper, but this one is better because it has higher order microphones. It has, it has 30, 32, uh, 32 microphones. You see here there are 32 microphones, uh, 32 channels. If I turn on this right now, not, it's not plugged in yet, I didn't have the time to plug it in. But if I plug it in, all these channels become live. All these capsules, um, each one of them is associated with one of these uh, level meters. Okay? And what happens there, these I can now code them, or they're coded into spherical harmonics, and I can decode them using a decoder to whatever order I want. Here's a decoder right here that I can do third or fourth order decoder. This is fourth order decoder, this is third uh, decoder. And I can go to an octagon or 3D, 20 speakers. So now, if I, if I choose that, I go to the 3D mixer, look what happens. I have here 20 speakers surrounding me. But these 20 speakers are not just regular 20 speakers, they are getting signals from a decoder to reconstruct a higher order ambisonics field in that space. One thing I forgot to mention to you when I did, when I did the uh, uh, demo uh, with the uh, a cappella group is that uh, not only I can move the speakers, I mean the, the sources, but I can move the head. 
I can move the head anywhere I want in, in the field, uh, up and down. And I can also have six, I can uh, yaw the head like this. Uh, I can pitch, uh, pitch it up and down. And I can r roll, it's called raw pitch and yaw. So I have six degrees of freedom, X, Y, Z, raw pitch and yaw. Uh, raw pitch and roll, rather, yaw, pitch and roll. Um, so when I did, when I, I forgot to do the, when the mix, I, I forgot to just move around and show you that it, it would be exactly as you're moving around. So I have a recording I did two years ago of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra performing Beethoven's Ninth live with Sir Simon uh, Rattle conducting. And we, we took the 20 microphones, mapped them into, and I can play it for you. I have it right here on my computer. Those of you interested in classical music recording. And we can recreate the orchestra in 3D. And then we can navigate the orchestra by moving the head. Say I want to go to the timpani uh, closer or to the singer. You can just do it by navigating the sound field. What's nice now is that w with this module, I can now drop in anybody's HRTF and do a mix, a mix for, for them. Because now, when I go from this generic 32 channel coding and I, I bring it up here to the speakers, I can change, I can change the HRTF. I can choose Ishmael's HRTF if he happened to have one on his USB stick. And suddenly, that's him inside that sound field. So if I, if I go right here, um, if I yaw, pitch, and roll, he will hear exactly as if he in that sound field rock pitch and yaw. What about XYZ? Well, XYZ also works. If you start now navigating, you will start, without moving the microphone, you can start navigating in, in that sound field. There, however, you incur, with a single microphone, you incur errors as you start getting further and further away for a given order of ambisonics order. So if you go very far from the position where the microphone is, uh, with the navigation, you start hearing artifacts uh, with higher frequencies, and uh, less, lesser accuracy. And we just finished writing a, uh, a few papers on um, a project on making that much better by using an array of HOA microphones. So you have four or five microphones around the room or have an orchestra, and then you can navigate pretty accurately around that room by using these algorithms that we, are, we, are de uh, we have developed. So, um, but the nice thing about this is that you can take an, a binaural recording made for Ishmael. I mean, uh, you can take a recording made with this microphone and make it individualized for anybody after the fact. Last thing I want to say is uh, in my talk, I had a couple of slides to t show you about what happens if we have more than one listener. So if you have more than one, one listener, with this technology, we're locked to a single sweet spot. And that's one of the um, caveats of this technology. It's a single sweet spot technology or an allocated sweet spot, as I, as I mentioned. In, in order to solve this, we use phase arrays. So phase arrays are, but they look very much like this, actually. Like one row of this guy, or a bunch of them together, it doesn't matter. Uh, there are, we control their phases in such a way that we can cancel the front waves and leave only beams of sound. And then we can steer these beams anywhere we want. So imagine, uh, this is one mounted on top of my small one, on top of my loudspeaker, this is one in the lab. So we have here two dummy heads. This is a phase array. Uh, made out of, uh, I think, 32 speakers. And then we can produce, these are drawn by, you know, by hand, but uh, you can produce beams of sound, and you can steal them at 30 frames per second. And with a camera on top, you can find multiple heads in the room, and we can produce as many beams as we want. So if, suppose we have four people in the room, we can create two beams for every person, and as that person walks, walks around, those two beams follow him in real time. And each beam has a Bach filter, like the one we just did for Ishmael. We can be individualized or it can be generic. Either way, that would, even generic one would work fine. And suddenly, multiple people have a Bach sweet spot, and then we have solved the problem of a single sweet spot. But that, requ that requires special speakers, and these speakers, it's not just speakers, it's the electronics. If you, uh, uh, it's that box sitting in the center that has all the electronics to cause, to, cause, to create the beams. So uh, the the price to pay is that you cannot anymore use any speakers. The Bach filter works with any speakers. Your laptop speakers, uh, phone speakers. There is actually, I'll show you, I'll give you a demo with um, Bluetooth speakers that, that, that were big sellers uh, when they were around by, Jam, uh, by Jawbone, which gives you a 3D, uh, 3D uh, sound feel from uh, Bluetooth speakers because you can design a Bach filter for any two speakers. But to have multiple speed spots, you need special uh, phase array a system to produce these beams 
that follow people around the room. And this has been developed and all, all done, so there's no more research in that field, particularly in, that we are doing. Um, OK, so I'll stop right here. I know you, gentlemen, they had a question okay, at the we'll Nostra. Talk later on. Yes. Um, so I'll take uh, questions, and then we can play with those of you who want to hang out for here for a while. You can sit in the sweet spot and listen to music and different sounds. Yes, yes, please. I was interested with the, with the beams. Yes. Uh, it sounds like that's doing what ultrasonic speakers. Very good question. Uh, completely different, but that's the main goal. Uh, I was wondering about the lower range because ultrasonic. Absolutely. Is so, so ultrasonic is lousy at the lower range, as you know. Ultrasonic speaker work on the following principle: they send a very, very high intensity uh, carrier wave, ultrasonic, about 30. I actually, uh, I borrowed one for about a month, and I played with it from Cambridge uh, uh, Light, something called uh, uh, Sound Torch, I think they call them. Uh, and um, I measured, it's about 30, 32 kilohertz, 34 kilohertz, very, very high. If you have a dog, don't shine that thing, <laughs> because it will, it will deafen them. So uh, if we play that, uh, I mean, uh, if you have such intensity, and you, you put an audio, you mix it with an audio uh, signal, uh, this is such high intensity that it actually heats the air. It does nonlinear, uh, it, it does nonlinear uh, um, uh, uh, decoupling with the air, and then emits the radio wave, the uh, the frequency, uh, the uh, the audio waves. The audio waves are then carried in a, almost a beam, so you can really zoom in on everybody here. And then you can it's used for some displays in museums and so on. But as you mentioned, because we're starting at 32 kilohertz carrier, uh, it has lousy. Uh, low frequency response. By lousy, I mean starting at two kilohertz, it goes more than uh, about more than 30 dBs per octave. Okay, so it's just like a you know, fifth order filter, or whatever. Very, very steep. Um, so it's good for some application. This is full range. Okay, this uh, can get you down to 100 hertz, no problem. Um, it doesn't have. Uh, in order to get that collimation, you need many, many speakers. So uh, you, you can have. Uh, so the uh, ultrasound has the advantage of have you. Better the beams can be collimated for a long distance, and uh, but doesn't have good response. That's not good for for music or for uh, full spectrum content, full band content. And uh, how about interferences of these beams? No, the beams. When people are moving around. Yeah, it follows them. Uh, uh, it follows. Of course, if you are uh, no, if you're standing one behind the other, there are all kinds of problems. There are shattering problems, and the beams are on top of each other. But generally speaking, as long as you are resolved from the camera, there are two heads then the, the two heads are getting four beams that they are uh, separate. Yes? Just a quick question. Yes. How narrow you can get this beam? Well, the beams are actually, uh, uh, um, they're, not called, they're not really strictly beams as that laser beams. They are, uh, if, uh, remember, these are m many speakers sending many wave fronts and getting canceled. So depending on the frequency and the number of filters, you get different side lobes. And you, uh, what we call beam is the main side lobe, which is usually the center side lobe. So depending on the uh, design of the speaker and, uh, and the distance from it, because actually these beams uh, diverge. So typically, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, they're so narrow that from a distance up to four meters, to three, four meters, you can do very go good crosstalk cancellation without the filter. And we have, uh, I have plus what I show you without a filter, because you can, if you shine a beam to the right ear, your head is, uh, I mean, um, you can make you can make the left ear so much. Uh, the left ear is so shadowed because the beam is so narrow. That you can do 3D audio without even Bach filter. But if you add a Bach filter on top, it will take care of any of that leakage, and you get very high cost of cancellation. So there are, uh, but the the quality degrades as a num as if we if we drop the number of speakers or if you get far away. Okay? But they are they are from a, uh, a near field up to three four meters. They are the size less than size on the head uh, for yeah. a typical. Yeah, for the work shown by my Matthias Frank and Francis Hopper together, it's really fancy fact from eight years ago. Yeah. I'm using phase arrays for, for Yes, phase, phase arrays have been around for the sector is speaking because yeah. since the beam gets vital with low frequencies. And I'm sorry, since the beam, okay. the beam gets vital with yes. low frequencies. Yes. So you get you introduce a kind of frequency dependent beam size. Yes. Um, so this causes problems. Yes. But anyway, so yes. 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 Uh, yes. I mean, everything is is a is a pretty tough problem. I mean, uh, you pay a price for uh, some fidelity and also from beam leakage uh, if you keep the beam constant, uh, size constant. So, but uh, from a perceptual point of view, these things work perfectly fine. There, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I could have brought one with me as an audio uh, as a demo, which is quite impressive. But I 
chose not to because of uh, limited time. So one thing I didn't show you also is the headphones technology. Remember, headphones, by all uh, audio for headphones, works beautifully, we said, but we have a problem. Uh, first, you have to equalize them. And we, we said that's a big, big, if you want to do it perfectly, you have to equalize the headphones. And that's not a trivial matter. But also, uh, we have the head rotation problem. The other thing is with headphones, uh, and I don't know if it, maybe you have a statistic, but last time I checked uh, uh, from studies done, uh, a report in a book by uh, Blauert, which is a standard textbook on spatial audio, roughly only if you take a binaural recording done with one head and play it to everybody in this room, this is a non-matched recording. Only about 30% will get spatially decent image. The rest of us, including myself, unfortunately, uh, I hear the image, unless it was done with my own head, very close to my head. Binaural doesn't work for me by itself. So, so uh, uh, doing transonal audio, audio allows us to do a trick where we can make binaural audio work for 100%. And that trick, and I'll describe it in, in just uh, one minute, it, we do a, uh, uh, here, an emulation of this system in front of us. So basically, um, without going th through this uh, chart, what this tells you is that I can either physically or virtually, we're using the, the mixer, I can um, emulate the system, crosstalk canceled speakers, because I can measure the, uh, the, the, I also brought headphones to show you, those of you who are interested in headphones. Um, what I can do, I can make him hear exactly, make Ishmael hear exactly what he just heard through the headphones, which can be done by measuring the impulse response of that system, of course, and emulate correctly through the headphones. And that's, that's perfectly done because I'm using his own HRTF. I, I make, I make a uh, measurement with his, with his own ear. But, but what I can do, I can emulate this system with a Bach filter. Therefore, he will hear this system's 3D audio, which works for pretty much everybody. That guarantees now, if I play anything by normal that, to that headphones uh, processing, which we call Bach HP, 100% of people are going to have an externalized image. Plus, because I'm emulating the speakers, I can use that same camera to track the head and the image will stay fixed. And I, those of you who want to do that, can stick around, we can do that together. And you will see, I can take a, a recording, play it, a binaural recording with headphones. It doesn't matter if it's your head or not, you'll hear it completely externalized because you hear it, hear it emulated to that speaker system. So we solve the problem of uh, head internalized sound by emulating speakers. And that gives us the opportunity to also to do head tracking, rotational head tracking, to make sure the image stays fixed in 3D space. So we solve that problem too. Of course, we are adding the sound of the speakers. <laughs> we are adding the sound of that room if there's a room. Uh, we, can, we can bypass that by doing an emulation in a room of your liking with point sources if you want, we're using that mixer that I showed you, showed you. But this is another technology that you can do uh, that's based on this transoral or you know, um, speaker-based crosstalk cancellation. All right, so I will uh, stop right here. And uh, are there any questions? If not, those of you who want to hang out here before lunch or during lunch, I'll stick around and I'll play you sounds so you can experience yourself and not, not, not trust just what Ishmael is, uh, is telling you. <laughs> well, thank right. you very much hey. for this talk. Thank yeah. you.